This week on Quadriga, election blows for Merkel. No room for maneuver? Germany's opposition Social Democrats trounced Chancellor Angela Merkel's party in a key regional election, which also cost her another member of government. Merkel describes the defeat as painful, but says it won't affect her policies on the Eurozone debt crisis. But given the pain and anger felt by people in countries such as Spain and Greece, how long can the chancellor keep insisting on austerity? The new French president says he's determined to take Europe down a different path. Will this leave Merkel isolated, or will she, and should she, as head of Europe's strongest economy, prevail? Your host this week, Melinda Crane. Hello and welcome. Angela Merkel's poll numbers remain impressive, but critics say she's a giant with clay feet. So just how have recent events weakened the German chancellor and undermined her austerity course? That's what we want to talk about today on Quadriga with three people who've been following the Eurozone crisis very closely. Geraldine Schwartz is a correspondent for the German-French broadcaster Arte. She is a French journalist who has also covered international events for the French news agency AFP and for Bloomberg in Paris. Margaret Heckel is a German freelance journalist who's reported for some of Germany's leading business publications. She's also served as political editor at the newspaper Die Welt. And Athanasios Pitsoulis is professor of microeconomics at Cottbus University. He's of Greek origin and he grew up and studied here in Germany. Margaret Heckel, uh, as we saw last weekend, a very disastrous showing for Angela Merkel's uh, Christian Democrats in the key state of North Rhine-Westphalia. Now, in 2005, a disastrous showing in that same state was the beginning of the end for Angela Merkel's predecessor, Gerhard Schröder. So could history be repeating itself here? Well, we'll see. It's going to be very interesting to follow these events. Uh, although I think we have a different situation because Chancellor Schröder at that point was panicking and uh, on the same evening of that election he said that he will call new elections, premature elections. And Angela Merkel didn't do that. She's much more calm and stoic and she has reacted in changing her government, in firing one of her key ministers. Um, but uh, she is continuing in other ways calmly and she's definitely not calling premature elections. So she still has over a year to sort of rally her government, rally her coalition and then will go into elections in uh, the autumn of 2013. She is of course facing a lot of criticism from both of her coalition partners. That's right. That's right. And she had to fire one of her ministers. We have already been talking about that because of this criticism. But again, so far, both uh, her partners are going to keep uh, going. They're going to keep. Uh, they're going to stay in the coalition. And uh, as long as they're staying, there's, there's not going to be any need to call premature elections. And my Merkel is just counting on things sort of calming down a little bit. Same with the euro crisis, which has been heating up, of course. And uh, she's um, sort of once she dis once she decided her course, she's really staying, and she's uh, she's got very strong nerves. <laughs> Geraldine Schwarz. Angela Merkel has, of course, faced a lot of criticism abroad as well, including in France, in your own country. What are people there saying? Do they see Merkel and her leadership as being weakened? Uh, well, when you talk about the people, it's a bit broad, but I would say 52% of the French elected Hollande, uh, who made part of his campaign uh, on uh, against Merkel. So we can uh, make the conclusion that 52% of the French are against Merkel's uh, European policy, even if it's not the reason why they elected uh, Hollande. He has very much support uh, there um, to impose another uh, way of uh, leading the European policies. And uh, indeed, he in fact in his campaign remind us, he said he was going to get more out of the Germans and he really went head to head against Germany in some of the big debates, didn't he? Yes. Well, uh, even I mean, though Germany wasn't uh, present at the table. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, we shouldn't take that too seriously because it was a candidate in an ele election campaign. So he had to, um, Sarkozy was uh, facing charges of being the little dog of Merkel. And uh, Hollande 
really use this uh, argument against Sarkozy. Um, now, as we've seen on Tuesday, um, they are two person of compromise. He's not that radical. And uh, I think we can expect from Hollande to be uh, to try to go uh, to find an agreement with Merkel. We're going to come back to that. But let's hear first how people see it in Greece. Athanasios Pitsoulis, Germany often also portrayed in rather negative terms in your country. What are people there saying now about Macron? Do they see her as weakened? Absolutely. Uh, I don't think that they see her as weakened because they are not very well informed about the, say, internal aspects of, uh, of German government. But um, they, uh, they perceive Angela Merkel as, uh, as something very negative, in a very negative way. In a, in a way, she has become a, a, a hate, hated person by many Greeks. Uh, a lot of the Greeks, uh, very normal Greek people that I talked to uh, a couple of days ago when I, when I last went to Greece, uh, are really frustrated uh, about the austerity program that they perceive uh, Angela Merkel has imposed on the Greeks. And um, they, uh, they, they, they perceive the austerity program as some form of punishment for economic sins uh, of the Greeks. And, and that, is, um, that is adding to the existing anger and frustration in Greece. So this is, it's a quite explosive mixture. It sounds like you're telling me they almost see the austerity program as a kind of a Versailles treaty, as a vindictive yes, act. In a way, in a way, in a way. It's, uh, it's perceived as a vindictive act, um, as, as punishment, uh, and um, the, the Greeks are uh, unanimously uh, agreeing that uh, the program is, uh, was, was developed uh, and imposed by Angela Merkel. So they, they concentrate their criticism on, on, on Merkel herself. Um, a couple of months ago, the discussion in Greece was not as polarized as it is now. So everybody is concentrating on, on Merkel because she has emerged as the, uh, as the responsible uh, figure. So, Margaret Heckel, as we've just heard, there quite a bit of resistance abroad to the austerity program and savings uh, pressure that the Germans have been putting on Europe. Now, here within Germany, what's the sentiment? Are people slowly starting also to oppose that program here at home? We've certainly heard the international press interpreting the election results in North Rhine-Westphalia in that direction, saying that it was a vote by people in that part of Germany, and it is a very populous, important state, um, against the savings policy, against the austerity program. Is that true? Well, we didn't really have an austerity program in Germany. We had it years ago when uh, Chancellor Schröder was uh, governing, and he put through very extensive labor market reforms, which really made people suffer because uh, the pay rises in Germany were much, much slower than in the rest of Europe. And that's basically at the root of the problem we are having now, because Germany did uh, their share of very hard reforms in the past, and now we are uh, exploiting. Uh, we are exploiting this. We are German, the German economy has been growing quite uh, rapidly, even through the crisis. And uh, basically, we now have uh, uh, the results of these reforms that now have to be imposed in the rest of the European countries, especially the southern countries. So in a way, it would be much better for both Greece and the other countries to look at the German example as sort of uh, the example on the way forward, if they are now going through that kind of reforms in a way, they will, uh, they will prosper afterwards now. And that's the core of the whole discussion. And where would you say that German people on the whole stand? My impression, I was in North Rhine-Westphalia to cover the election. My impression was that people there were saying, hey, look, we've been tightening our own belts here right. in this state for a long time. We've got a lot of debt in our own state. We've been asked to cut back on teachers, on policemen. Why should we tighten our own belts when people abroad aren't tightening theirs even more? In other words, my impression was they're saying less austerity at home, but still austerity abroad. Would you right. say that's right? Well, the still austerity part is definitely correct. And that's uh, and actually Germans are really losing their patience with Greece. And, you know, should, should Greece decide 
so, so to continue that course, I'm sure um, the sympathy, sympathy is going to run out for the country. Um, in terms of austerity in Germany, we have the Social Democrats, of course, uh, the opposition party uh, um, uh, having won that election, and they will uh, force Merkel to uh, to be less austere, to sure, to to spend more. Yes, that's I see I lots up. of head nodding <laughs> over here. In yes. other words, if I not if I <laughs> interpret those nods correctly, uh, Geraldine Schwartz, uh, you would also say Germans are not necessarily turning against austerity as it pertains to the rest of Europe. Um, well, I, it's, I would say, like, like you, you mentioned, uh, the SPD will uh, put pressure now on, the, on, on Merkel to uh, lose uh, the, the, the pressure, um, because now they have also the support of Hollande, which uh, really makes a big difference. I mean, all the countries were waiting, actually, for the French elections uh, to know if they have to stick to Merkel's policy Absolutely. or if they have a new alternative. And now there is suddenly a new alternative. And I would say, like, all the southern countries, inclusive Greece, Italy, Spain, are supporting Hollande. And probably most of the northern countries, the pain countries, are uh, supporting uh, uh, Merkel. So um, now the Hollande has just been uh, sworn in French uh, president, as a French president. So he's aims are not clear uh, right now and i think europe is waiting for him to define his uh, his his policy because uh, nowadays we still don't know what he means with um, agreement on uh, a new uh, growth pact what does he mean with uh, expenses which will support growth it's all very vague right now that, of course, is the question that we have in our title, Room for Maneuver. I yeah. want to come right back to that. But just briefly staying with the internal political situation here in Germany, Athanasios Pitsoulis, on the one hand, yes, perhaps some more pressure now from the SPD, which may be feeling regenerated after that election result in this important state of North Rhine-Westphalia. On the other hand, we also have a coalition partner, junior coalition partner, the Free Democrats, that came out of that election with stronger results. What effect do you think that will have on Angela Merkel's ability to govern? We, we know, of course, that the FDP, this junior coalition partner, has not always been on the same course with her when it comes to Euro politics. Yes, well, I think that uh, Angela Merkel's room for maneuver is um, is getting smaller because of these political developments. Uh, the if I interpret right the um, uh, the things that uh, politicians, FDP politicians uh, in in Northern Westphalia said and in uh, in all over Germany, and I can perceive uh, a slight shift to the left in the FDP. Uh, maybe they are already preparing for becoming a candidate for some grander coalition in Germany in the future, after the next elections. This Meaning with the other big party, yes, the Social yes, Democrats, yes, and yes. not necessarily with the Christian Democrats. It's possible. Uh -huh. I, I don't know whether the, uh, the, the party can transform its program in, in, into this di in this direction, but uh, it, is, it is at least a possibility. And um, if Angela Merkel sees that, that potential coalition partners uh, are shifting their policy, uh, policies away from, from her cause, then this must necessarily diminish her room for maneuver. But, but she's still very popular. Yes, I mean, absolutely. the rates are amazing. Absolutely. So, but one person alone cannot. The cannot the, win the elections and weren't really against Angela Merkel. I mean, the well, vote was not against her. No, it's clear that she's going to spend. She's going to have to spend more in order to uh, to both compromise with the Social Democrats, the opposition, and her smaller coalition partner, the Free Democrats. So we will see more uh, investment. They, they're going to call it investment in education. They're going to call it investment in uh, small children. They're going to call it investment. Investment in uh, in kindergartens and and preschooling uh, facilities, and so that's definitely going to happen. And of course, you could also call it just more spending, but uh, uh, it's not. It's 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 really uh, a question whether it's going to. Uh, but it's going to make her room for maneuvering smaller because, in terms of the next election, Merkel is only going. To, she's only thinking about the election in autumn 2013. That's we're we're 
14 months away from that. That's the only thing on her mind right now besides the euro crisis. And she's going to tailor everything towards being reelected. And in terms of re-election, I don't see her chances smaller in any way because the coalition possibilities are still going to be very varied uh, no matter what's going to happen right now. In terms of uncomfortable partnerships, uh, Angela Merkel may be feeling some concern abroad as well as at home. The tandem that had been called Merkel-Z, Nicolas Sarkozy and Angela Merkel is now a thing of the past. And looking abroad, her main partner will now be the new French president, Francois Hollande. The meeting the whole of Europe has been waiting for. The new French president, François Hollande, and German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Journalists look for signs of awkwardness. But after a first tête-à-tête -tête in Berlin, they're keen to present a united front. We know the responsibility we have as Germany and France for a good development of Europe. And I think in this spirit we will find the solutions for the individual problems. Yet they have fundamentally different ideas on how to tackle the Eurozone debt crisis. I am for fiscal seriousness and I want to reach our goals. But because I am for fiscal seriousness, I am for growth. In the past, French and German leaders of all political stripes have worked well together, such as Gerhard Schröder and Jacques Chirac, and Helmut Kohl and François Mitterrand. Yet rarely has so much been at stake, because the ability of Merkel and Hollande to bridge their gaps could determine the future of both the Euro and, with it, the European project. Geraldine Schwarz, uh, as we heard in the report, lots of journalists watching that meeting to see how the two got along. Mm -hmm. What was your impression? There have been so many predictions that, uh, that they're going to be awkward with each other. Was, was that the case? Um, I think they are actually quite similar. Uh, they were both underestimated by the party. They are both sober. They are both unpretentious and very, very pragmatic and serious. So I think these are two people of compromise. And um, this is um, a good basis for the future of Europe. Then, of course, they have totally oppo opposite uh, ideas of how they will uh, make uh, uh, save the euro. Um, Hollande wants uh, first um, to support growth with uh, more expenses, and he thinks uh, with growth he will reduce the deficit. And Merkel has the opposite uh, opposite idea that uh, first uh, we have to reduce the deficit and this will bring uh, growth. So now today we still don't know how they will uh, find uh, an agreement. But on Tuesday I think what is uh, important to notice is that uh, Hollande didn't mention one of the things he announced during his election, with, with, uh, during his campaign, was that he would ask for uh, new mandates for the ECB, European Central Bank, wanting the, wanting the European Central Bank to be able to finance directly the states. And he didn't mention that on Tuesday, which means he already conceded uh, on something to Merkel, knowing it's the red line. So there's two aspects here. Let's start briefly with that personal aspect. The fact is, Margaret Heckel, Sarkozy and Merkel were also not a natural fit at the beginning. They, she especially worked very hard on that relationship, absolutely, didn't, we? didn't she? Absolutely, absolutely. Actually, they were quite opposite, and they still are very opposite, because Sarkozy is a totally different character mm -hmm. as Merkel, very impulsive, very sort of macho, and, um, and, and she had a very hard time at the beginning. It took almost two years till, the, till both of them really sort of found some sort of understanding. And you know, meeting and meeting and meeting and talking. But he made her laugh. <laughs> he made her, yeah, he made her laugh. Well, that's, maybe Monsieur Hollande has a sense of humor. Right, we don't know yet. That's right. That's right. I would agree completely with you that in, in they're, they're much better fit, uh, Merkel and yes. Hollande. And now the question is how they could reconcile their different uh, political ideas, the different strategies. And there, actually, Merkel is uh, in the advantage point because she's such an experienced 
experienced politician, such, such an experienced uh, uh, he, uh, head of government. And you know now uh, they're just preparing to fly to the United States uh, for a G7 or G8 meeting and a NATO meeting. And Hollande is the new guy on the block. He doesn't really know his way around. Whereas Angela Merkel, she's been through all that so many times. So if she said, you know, um, Monsieur le Président, I don't know how they call each other, I'm going to help you with all this, uh, I think they're going to find a, a good way of cooperation very soon. And then they will have to reconcile, of course, their political ideas. But that's not that difficult. Let's talk about how far they really are apart on the issue of growth and debt reduction, and also how much room they have to be far apart. Antonasio Spitsoulis, um, the fact is, Angela Merkel said right before the French uh, election, once again, I'm not against growth. I'm simply against debt-financed growth that is not sustainable. Is there really so much difference between the two? Um, yes, there's much difference when it comes to economic policies. Uh, there are two, say, basic approaches to um, creating growth. Um, the first is to... Um, have a small state, uh, leave the economy operate f freely uh, and uh, not trying to fuel growth by uh, huge government programs, spending programs and all that. And the different strategy, the other strategy, is to uh, try trigger growth uh, by government spending, explicitly by government spending. And uh, large-scale uh, spending programs, for instance, uh, fall in this uh, category, infrastructure programs and all that. And I think that uh, Merkel and Hollande have, have two very, very different positions on, on how to create growth. So they will sooner or later clash when it comes to uh, their growth strategy for Europe. And they will have to find some form of compromise, and that will be very difficult. But Hollande promised during the campaign, and once again after his election, that he will bring France's debt levels, their, their budget deficit, down to the EU limit. Now, how much big spending can he do if he wants to keep that promise? Yes. <clears throat> and the markets will be expecting him to keep that promise, ab abso of Absolutely. But the question is, how long uh, will it take him to bring the debt level down to 60% of GDP, what is allowed under the uh, stability criteria? Uh, in one year, two years, five years, ten years? That's, that's a big question. So, mm -hmm. so by 2017. 2017. <laughs> so this yeah. is a medium-term program. And this gives him some leeway to... Uh, to spend in order to trigger growth, but the, the problem is that uh, these big government programs, spending programs, do not necessarily create growth. But they the, have always to be accompanied, accompanied with uh, by uh, structural reforms. But he didn't announce big uh, government uh, ex expenses. Uh, expenditures. Where would, where would the growth come from? Uh, no, no, he doesn't. I mean, he doesn't want to support the demand. He wants to support the offer. I mean, he wants to supply. Su supply. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and he doesn't want to appear as a Keynesian. 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 He's a social democrat still, huh? and he wants to support uh, like middle, uh, s small and middle-sized uh, industries. He wants to support innovation. He wants to support education. He wants to support all the sectors uh, which can support growth. He doesn't probably, really doesn't want to appear like someone who's going to make expenditures uh, probably like has, France did previously. He probably has something like uh, the example of Gerhard Schröder, the former German chancellor in mind. Or when yeah, I hear yeah, what he Geraldine what Schwarz just said, I even think of Barack Obama. A yeah, lot of small yeah. measures. You yeah. can ask how much they really do change. Yeah. Uh, many people in the U.S. would say not enough, very marginal, mm. but perhaps that's all he has room for. Well, I mean, this is, um, he has room for that, but what is really important is he's not going to build uh, big highways or, uh, this is this is not what he's going to do. I mean, he's not a socialist. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, he really wants to make a distinction, distinction between these two kinds of, uh, of uh, spendings. 
I think the really important question for him is going to be whether he will manage to uh, put through enough symbolic measures in the first, say, 100 days of his reign so that the French will be content with their vote, that they will feel that will feel they have voted rightly, the right candidate in. Because otherwise, it's really extremely hard to do what he said uh, he would do with these small measures. Um, because he won't have growth instantly with doing with what, what you've just been saying. And so the situation that the French will become very disillusioned very quickly mm -hmm. Is, re is there? It's it's just there on the table. And then what's gonna th what's gonna happen then? You know, if, if uh, Hollande's poll ratings are gonna go down very quickly in the next sort of three four months, then he'll be in a really tough spot in the under European agenda mm. because then he'll be sort of the president who failed. Let's let's look at the European level now briefly. You mentioned one possible compromise, Geraldine Schwartz, that we might be already seeing from François Hollande, namely not mentioning the European Central Bank, which of course is a big bone of contention between Germany and France. Athanasio Spitzulis, what are some other compromises we might see between Germany and France looking ahead on Eurozone policy? Well, the uh, one big question is whether, for instance, uh, um, the next Greek government, hopefully uh, they, they can form a government in, in June, uh, might try to renegotiate the um, memorandum, the, what the Greeks call the austerity program. And uh, um, in order to get a better deal, which the government can sell uh, to the to the population in Greece um, as something that they have achieved, and uh, this has to be uh, agreed in Berlin and Paris. So this could be some uh, some something where Hollande and Merkel could compromise on, like giving the Greeks more time to implement structural reforms, keeping them afloat for half a year longer, or something like that. Um, I think that this is uh, something where, where a compromise is, is possible. And this might be a win-win situation for everybody. But the question is whether uh, the uh, governments of uh, Germany and France can find an interlocutor in Greece. Right. Geraldine Schwarz, we're also hearing a lot of talk about some kind of vague growth pact that the EU could put in place next to what's called the fiscal pact. The fiscal pact requiring, of course, all countries to adopt stricter budgetary measures and also submit them to oversight by European Union authorities. What might a growth pact look like? And do you think this is something that's already on the table between France and Germany? Um, well, it is on the table. I mean, because uh, Hollande uh, made part of his uh, campaign on that uh, promise uh, of adding, uh, having an extension of, of the fiscal pact with the growth pact because he needs it uh, if he wants uh, to to respect his uh, election pledges, which are based on uh, more spendings. So to finance these spendings, he needs. A commitment. He needs a commitment in the fiscal pact to support um, uh, uh, these these spending policies. But as I said before, it's not clear what he means with this kind of policy. How he wants to uh, justify his uh, expenses. This is the this is the problem. How do you how do you say okay these are expenses which will support growth, so they are allowed. These kinds of mm -hmm. debts are allowed. Where, where do you put the red line, the limit? That's why Merkel finds it uh, very dangerous to allow this. So, Margot Heckel, it might wind up being perhaps a largely symbolic attempt to make the fiscal pact look a bit softer, but without real teeth? Possibly. And we've been seeing that in the European Union for for very often that l large numbers were announced. If you remember the time in the first uh, uh, first uh, economic crisis in 2008, 2009, there were huge numbers announced both by the French president and the American president and, and uh, the leadership of Great Britain of how much money they were going to inject into their economies. And the money never came, basically. It was yeah. just announcements. And of course, they didn't do anything to create growth or anything. Only structural reform does that. And there we are back to Angela Absolutely. Merkel. And actually, the position of Angela Merkel 
is something which the other leaders are going to come around to. I'm convinced because only by doing structural reform in the hard way, you get your economy ready for the future and ready for the future challenges. And you can postpone that one year, two years, three years, but the, lo the longer you postpone it, the more uh, tense it will be on your population. Well, this is, of course, the message that Germany has right. repeatedly been giving to Southern Europe. But the fact is, you have to ask the question at a certain point, is the medicine killing the patient? The pain and chaos in Southern Europe do continue to deepen. Greece is looking all but ungovernable. And many people are asking, is Spain also on the brink? Another show of strength against austerity in the Spanish capital, Madrid. The demonstrators, the indignados, refuse to accept the government's handling of the economic crisis. Prime Minister Mariano Rajoy has cut social services, education and health in line with EU demands to reduce the deficit. But ordinary Spaniards fail to see any improvement in their daily lives. On the contrary, things appear to be getting worse. Spain is back in recession and unemployment in the country is the highest in the Eurozone. More than a staggering 50% of young people are now out of work. Many say austerity is simply not working. In Greece also, fear has reached new levels. Faced with political and economic uncertainty, people there are reported to have begun withdrawing money from their bank accounts, afraid of what the future may or may not bring. Anthanasios Pitsoulis, we just heard it in the report. Austerity simply not working. If you look at Spain, not even your own country, let's look at Spain, has made billions of euros in budget cuts. And yet, unemployment at record highs, growth basically not there. Um, isn't this medicine killing the patient? Well, it's, uh, it's medicine killing domestic demand because um, austerity programs uh, in the short run uh, um, will might increase unemployment, reduce wages, but this is necessary for countries that are not competitive on world markets to become competitive again. So this is, this is um, it's, it's a part of the solution actually. But if you uh, say, if austerity, if you do too, if the cuts are too big in the short term, if uh, uh, wages are, are, are falling uh, too quickly, then, then this has negative effects for the economies as a whole. And, and that is, of course, a problem. So the question is, uh, can we uh, make sure that the uh, structural reforms are going to be implemented by making austerity somewhat softer, right? by, by making sure that, uh, for instance, the, uh, the deficits and the debt levels are reduced in the medium term and not in the short term very quickly, just in order to calm the markets, right, to, to we, send positive signals to the markets. We're hearing some talk in that direction from EU officials this week, aren't we? Saying yes, Greece yes. might be allowed more time, for example. Yes, I'm, I'm, I mean, the, the Greece anyway needs more time because they have to form a working government, a workable government, and uh, currently they, they, they don't have one. Uh, and uh, that's a huge problem because there must be someone there in place to implement all these reforms. And uh, uh, in the worst case, Greece could end up in a period of uh, uh, prolonged political instability, uh, and that would be the, uh, the death of all the structural reforms. Nothing could be implemented. Margaret Heckel, on the other hand, how much can the EU ease up on austerity without the markets going into a tailspin and thereby driving debt costs even higher for these burdened countries? Yeah. I think with Greece, people are really losing patience within the European Union. And uh, as there are m more contingency plans now in place and uh, on, on the desks, I think uh, more and more influential people in the European Union are ready to let Greece go or to sort of push Greece out of the euro. The problem is with Spain and Italy, of course. And uh, should we see many more turbulences there, debt level, uh, debt financing costs rising dramatically, because obviously the European Union could not withstand both of them uh, um, going into a crash or even, not even leaving, one of them. not even <laughs> one of them, of course. And so Greece is a different problem. If Greece is not going to get their act together with the next election, and if Greece is not going to be able to form a workable government, if there are extremists uh, uh, becoming, uh, 
going to the going to the uh, becoming the main party then Greece will sort of they, everybody in the European Union will try to isolate Greece and sort of say they're a special case you know they're sort of a nut case basically and but but with Greece and Italy Greece and Italy are the real problem uh, which has to be dealt with in whatever way. Jardine Schwartz, uh, there has been talk about the fact that France, too, has the potential to be a southern European country, as, <laughs> as it's sometimes phrased. How yeah. worried are people there about going in that direction? Um, well, the situation is not good. I mean, the, the number is like 5.8% deficit, 9.8% uh, unemployment rate. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look good. <laughs> it doesn't look good, but it's not the situation. It's not the same. I mean, you can't compare, compare it. And um, and I think uh, just to, to, to come back to this uh, debate that the problem is the money. There is no money. So, I mean, there is not, not many alternatives. Than, uh, than to stick to Merkel's plan or to uh, accept the eurobonds. And France, for example, even if they're not in uh, such a situation as Greece, Hollande, how can Hollande finance his program? With eurobonds. And yeah. who will pay for eurobonds? <laughs> well, the only way that the Germans will pay for eurobonds, of course, is under some very, very tight conditions. Yeah. Perhaps someday they will come, but that's a whole yeah. other show, I would say, yeah, that's such but, I mean, a, a that's, complicated uh, who, issue. Who pays? This yeah. is, I mean, the whole thing behind these two oppos oppositions Absolutely. between yeah. Germany and France and between the austerity measure uh, uh, politicians and the others is who is paying. I who mean, this the is, bill. And the yeah. Germans are very worried it could be <laughs> It them. could be them. Now, yeah. let's go back to Greece because I'm afraid we don't have much time left and I would like to talk about the option that is now hanging like a sword over everybody's head, and that is an exit from the Eurozone. It was long thought to be unthinkable. We hear people are talking about it very seriously now, Athanasios Pitsouis. What would that mean? How could it look? Well, um, the problem is that this is an experiment uh, no one has ever tried before, so we, we, we don't know. We have no experience with something like that. Um, it could work if uh, the uh, other Mediterranean countries, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, uh, can be isolated from Greece. Greece could be put under some form of quarantine for some time. Uh, but for the Greeks, Euro exit would be a complete economic, would cause a complete, complete economic breakdown, at least in the short term. Uh, this, is, this must be clear to everybody. And tell us, tell us what that means. You have family in Greece. You're in close touch with people there. What does it mean for them? What kind of pain are they feeling? Uh, well, the Greeks are feeling a lot of pain. Everybody is feeling a lot of pain in Greece. Uh, I, when I visited my, my own family, uh, um, we, we discussed the whole situation. And just to give you one very personal example, my sister, uh, who is living in Greece, lost her job two times in the last year. And every, every time when uh, she was uh, re rehired by a new firm, uh, they hired her with a lower salary. So this is just one but one example of, of what many people in Greece are experiencing, unemployment and the lowering of their wages and incomes. Uh, but with uh, an imminent euro exit, all the Greeks who still have some money in their bank accounts would, would run to the banks uh, and try to get their capital abroad. So this is already happening. I know many people in Greece uh, who, who really have transferred all the euros they had on Greek bank, bank accounts uh, to German banks uh, or anywhere else but Greece. Uh, and, and that is a huge problem because if the banks do not, cannot draw on the deposits uh, of, uh, of that, say, domestic customers, then they cannot provide credit for the firms and then the firms cannot invest. And if the firms cannot invest, they cannot profit from the from the low wages. So this kills growth. It's a it's a conundrum. Margaret Heckel, what are you hearing here in Berlin? Is this an option that some German politicians are now coming to favor? Sure, patience is running out. There's, it's, it's absolutely clear that patience is running out. And contrary to a year ago, uh, now the contingency plans are there. So um, the finance ministry, the European Central Bank, the German, uh, the German bank, they all had, they, there are plans 
on the table of what to do would Greece decide to exit the euro. And so the fear of a complete crash, the fear of a complete breakdown of the financial system is receding. And with this fear receding, the sort of uh, the will to do it, the will to go through it, no matter what's going to happen, no matter you know the experiment, how it's going to run out, is rising. And so it really depends on the Greeks in the next election in June, what they're going to elect. If they're going to elect uh, parties which we, which the Germans would call extreme, um, then it's going to be very very hard. What I wonder when I hear all of this, when I hear Athanasios Pitsoulis describing that level of pain, when you, Geraldine Schwartz, talked to us about the social misery in France as well, what would this mean for European relations in general? Now, moving beyond the strictly economic level, but we've heard Athanasios Pitsoulis use words like vindictive, referring to the perception of the Germans. Where do you see relations between European countries heading in such a crisis? Um, well, I, I think the European relations uh, will depend very much on the relation between France and Germany, because they are two representing more or less half of uh, of of, uh, of Europe, and um, I think uh, a friendship, the German French friendship, has been going on for six years, and I don't think it's going to just finish from one day uh, to the other. So um, I'm I'm quite uh, I'm quite positive about this, and also it's not only uh, because of personal friendships, but it's also because uh, Hollande and Merkel know that they have the expectations of. Uh, millions of Europeans on their shoulder and that they will enter uh, history either as protector or destroyer of the euro. And this is uh, a very big responsibility and I think they will take it seriously. Antanasios Pitsoulis, very briefly, your response, we were asking how much room does Angela Merkel have to, to maneuver. Um, how does it look on the political side? Well, on the political side, I think that uh, it depends on uh, her will to go forward with the austerity program, while at the same time be open to compromise on a grand political level together with, uh, uh, with Hollande and other governments. Thank you very much to all of you for being with us today, and thanks to all of you out there for tuning in.